Patrick Monafrig. Welcome to your favorite leadership program in Africa. My name is Gracia Adjaman and my guest today is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Kobe Mensa. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we are going to have a wonderful time. This is the That Kenya Video Podcast. Welcome back. In Africa today, when people think about leadership, they mostly think of politics and dictatorship. Meanwhile, many Africans are conquering other sectors in spite of their meager resources. Dachi Kanya shares the leadership experiences of these leaders with you to help build the leadership skills of upcoming African leaders, both at home and abroad. Once again, my name is Gracia Adjaman, and I have with me on the show today, Dr. Kobe Mensah. Hello, sir. Hi, Grace. It feels good to have you on the show today. Very good. Very good to see you as well. Uh, okay. You're glowing. Thank you. you Thank look, you. You don't look bad today. Excellent. Thank All you right. for that. So, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, uh, Kobe Mensah, uh, actually from New Takradi. Uh, when I say Nitakradi, born and bred in Nitakradi, that is the western part of Ghana. Uh, obviously, I schooled there, uh, St. Peter's Primary School. Went on to Dr. Wu Kiyos in Takradi. And then I went to St. Augustine's College okay. in Cape Coast. Now, after that, you know, I went to uh, uh, what do you call uh, I did CIM, Charter Institute of Marketing in one of the management schools in Kumasi, uh, and then went to IPS, uh, then IPS. Now it's UPSA, okay. you know, to continue my CIM, you know, level three. And then after that, I left, you know, I, I worked briefly uh, with, okay. you know, CETO, that is Student and Youth Travel Organization, as a marketing manager. Okay. And then they transferred me uh, to South Africa. But before that, I had actually moved on to few African countries, you know, on CITO's tickets, you know, researching, and also working with the CITO officers in those, including Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and then, of course, finally to South Africa. And then, you know, I did my master's in Sheffield. After that, I thought, no, I had to do a PhD, mm -hmm. uh, because that's why I thought, perhaps, you know, I could make some leeway. So I hung on to do my PhD, obviously got married, had a child, eventually, you know, came back to Ghana. So that's yes. a little bit about me, yeah. Okay, so away from that, describe your country of birth from a touristic standpoint to a foreigner. Okay, uh, I always say that Ghana is vibrant. You know, to a foreigner, I would say Ghana is very vibrant. Uh, vibrant in its own right. Of course, Ghana is leadership, you know, because most of the, you know, the continent leadership initiatives had actually come from here, although we're experiencing a little bit of a dull moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, we're still in the, in the frame of the leadership. So first, I think that it's a vibrancy you know, of the country, a very welcoming country. Yeah. And so that's how I would actually describe okay. it. So tell us, besides Ghana, which other African country do you admire most? Well, that would definitely be Cote d'Ivoire, Okay, why? Full of lifestyle, you know. I, I lived in Cote d'Ivoire a little bit uh, when, you know, I was working with Cito. I got to understand the French, the way they relaxed about things. And obviously the entire, you know, work ethics is completely different from us. Mm -hmm. They sort of do not take things as seriously as we do, yet they get a work done, mm -hmm. you know. So I think I admire Cote d'Ivoire. You know, and then of course uh, I wouldn't actually leave out Nigeria. Okay. Again, I had opportunity to live in Nigeria. So, why they, do you like Nigeria? Yeah, Nigerians are very go-getters, okay. and throughout my period that I've lived and stayed with them, and kind of uh, you know associated with them, I think I admire their you know uh, zealousness. You know, the idea that they don't give up. Mm -hmm. So you could see the contrast. You know. The, the Ivorians being a very laid back, you know, subtle, Nigerians being a very go-getter, you know, mm -hmm. kind of spirit. But 
They are fantastic people. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, if any country that Ghana has to look up to and making sure that Africa will be a better place, is Nigeria. They have the market. They have the money. They have the values. They have everything that it takes. So I think that within the sub-region, we have the duty to actually work with Nigeria to have a better Africa. All right. So based on your experiences as a lecturer, how would you personally define leadership? Leadership is about boldness. You know, you, you've got to be bold, mm -hmm. you know, because you have competing, you know, interest. You have competing values. You have competing, you know, uh, uh, and uh, various or diverse characteristics, uh, diverse values, you know. And all these values and interests are competing for, uh, you know, the same national cake, as we call them. Now, you couldn't satisfy all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot actually satisfy all of them within the same time. So you have to make the bold decision to take out the essentials or to, you know, uh, kind of, uh, uh, how do you put it, to, to prioritize you know, which one should come first and be able to say to the people that I cannot do this, but I can do that for these reasons, etc. So leadership, first and foremost, is about being bold. Mm -hmm. But also it's about also making leaders. You know, a very good leader make leaders. Yeah. So you've got to actually replace. And so, yes, I think that leadership is about making leaders. You've got to replace. You know, you've got to have a mindset of making sure that you could actually have a succession and make sure that when you leave, who takes over? When you leave, who actually ensures that the system continues? Okay. When you leave, who makes sure that you know, the kind of legacy that you have in mind could be established? Yeah. And so if you're a leader and you don't actually have that thinking of making leaders, whilst you're a leader yourself, you have failed. Yeah. So leadership is about boldness and it's about making leaders to me. Can you name an African personality who has had an impact on you? Definitely will be Nkrumah. Nkrumah. I have lived, read about him, listened to text about him, both in a positive and negative text. I have also taken my time to sort of study what he meant and what actually, you know, he sought to do. And definitely I won't go any far mm -hmm. than, you know, choosing our own Nkrumah. I think he was fantastic mm -hmm. in every sense of it, you know, the way he led. Uh, the books he wrote, you know, the ideas he actually churned out, the challenges that he faced. So, so when I actually look at the books that he read and the and the kind of narrative that you hear from, I mean, the two leadership traits that I actually you know uh, gave out, you know, one the boldness and then two making leaders. You could actually see these in you know, a kinds of traits in you know, in Nkrumah. Of course, he actually shaped you know the global narrative on Africa. And not only that boldness, he also defined his leadership, you know, that his leadership was about making Africa better, bringing Africa together. So he had a defined scope that he worked on. And then, of course, you could look at the way he actually integrated Ghana's independence with the rest of the other African countries, making sure that their leadership themselves were stronger in order that we could actually have an Africa that is quite, you know, united. Yeah. So there was a clear agenda, you know, that was not mediocrity. Okay. That was in a very huge agenda, global stage. In fact, within the period of Nkrumah, you could see the entire world's attention on Ghana in particular, and then, of course, on the continent in general. Okay. But now, we, we do not see a clear-cut narrative you know, about Africa, and that's very, very disturbing. So I think that this is what I would actually say about whom I think you know, is my kind of leader. Okay. So, in your opinion, what makes an African leader stand out from the crowd of mediocrity? Yeah. I think that an African leader must define their scope. I mean, they, they must be, because you see, we have a world that is competing, not only for resources, but for ideas. You know? And so for an African leader to stand out, uh, not even from mediocrity, but from the crowd, you want to have a leader that is clear in their mind you know, what it is that they want to do, mm -hmm. and pursue that with boldness. Yeah. Now. If you do not have that, then of course, you know, you become the leader that is only for the daily bread, bread and butter issues. Of course, that's very important because that's why the majority of your people actually elected you because the broad base of the people are actually about bread and butter, especially when you look at our poverty indicators. But that does not actually establish your leadership in history. 
what would establish your leadership in history, whether you were bold, you were focused yeah. and set an agenda. And even if you didn't actually complete that agenda, can people define you by that bold vision yeah. that you had? If you lose that, I don't think you will be in history. Okay, so what are some of the challenges facing African leaders today? They lack, you know, gravitas. They lack okay. that sense of boldness. Uh, they, they easily cave in to negotiations mm -hmm. you know, of the West. Why? Because they, most of them, you know, come with, you know, self-seeking agenda. Uh, people will tell you they've spent so much money in gaining leadership, and so they have to recoup, which I think that is a very bad narrative uh, because, yes, the idea, the reason why you spend so much is because it's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You saw your people in a dire need, and you thought that there could be a better leadership to take them from that dire need, and that's why you spend money. Yeah. So when the narrative is about I spend so much when I have to recoup it, then you're not a leader. You know, because you have to make a sacrifice. And if that sacrifice that you have to make, you know, does not stay with you, you know, because people, you know, were imprisoned. I mean, Mandela wasn't in prison for, what, 27 years? Yeah. That's a sacrifice. You know, uh, Nkrumah himself was in prison several times. You know, he sacrificed his family. He left government penniless, although there were propaganda that he had himself mansions, but it wasn't happening. And... Currently, if you look at the, the, the leadership of this country and their, and their children, you probably could see that the Nkrumah's children are one of the most impoverished you know, uh, children of a leader you can find. That's the sacrifice you pay. So if the idea is that you have to spend so much money and you have to recoup it, you've lost your leadership you know, characteristics. So yes, I don't see current African leaders as bold. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, they are not fearless. Okay. They are not, you know, able to challenge the status quo. They cannot take us to the world stage. And they came in too easily. So I think that these are some of the things. So moving forward, what was the defining moment, the aha moment that caused you to realize you could lead others? For me, it's about, you know, my background. I mean, I mean uh, when it comes to people that I look up to, uh, my father is one, right. uh, my big brothers, you know, some of them. Uh, I think that the, 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 the background and where through the support of my family I got to, I realized that I also have to pay back, you know, uh, that, that responsibility. And so for me, the common principle that I wrote on people to be where I am meant that People have to ride on me to okay. be to get to where they are, and that's why I feel that making leaders must be a priority for every leader. Mm -hmm. People must ride on you. If you put yourself forward every time, making yourself the reference point, you are not a leader. Okay. People must be the reference point through you, you know, through your support. They must be the reference point. So if they get to be the reference point and you're not, they would end up referring to you as the one who made them the reference point. So tell us, what is your worst leadership moment? A moment that caused you to almost give up on your aspirations. Did you give up? Did you not give up? Tell us the story. No, I, 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 I've never given up any day, only that sometimes you get disappointed. Mm -hmm. You get disappointed, especially when the people you seek to facilitate, not help. I do not want to use the word help because it is not for me to help, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah. I add on, I facilitate, yeah. you know. So uh, when people you want to facilitate don't seem to be pulling, you know, their weight, don't seem to realize the challenges they face and to take on, you know, some part of the responsibilities themselves, you tend to give up or you tend, you tend to feel like giving up mm -hmm. because then the point is, what's the point? If you're not, you know, moving according to the pace that you think they should in order that they can actually come out of you know, whatever challenge is there. Because I, I personally, when I look back, I can assure myself that I really you know, prepared myself for the journey. Mm -hmm. Because quite of the things that I did, you know, I once was telling my friends that I walked from IPS to you know, the Parliament House, not okay. alone. You know, myself and my group, myself and some a group of you know, uh, friends, that when we were organizing the Pan-African Student and Youth Festival, we worked from 
you know, IPS to, to, to the Parliament House just to meet some of the parliamentarians and talk to them about the things that we wanted to do. We didn't have money. And we made a lot of trips by foot, mm -hmm. you know. I, I, I sort of uh, did a lot of things that today, when I look back, I said to myself, whoa, I really went. But those are the things that you have to put in the input that you need to actually, you know, uh, kind of do in order that that can prepare you, the toughness that you can have, the skins that you, your tough skins that you can have. So we've been through quite a number of things. It wasn't, I don't call it challenging, you know, upbringing because, as I said, people have really serious challenges, yeah. you know, very, very serious challenges that when you hear, Kofi Kanata would say, you know, yours is even nowhere in here, <laughs> you know, what yeah, people, well, exactly, yeah. that's correct, you see. So I don't see it as a challenging upbringing, but yes, I did put in the effort that could actually, you know, put me here. I self-taught myself a number of disciplines. Okay, wow, that's amazing. You are watching the Dache Kania video podcast. Once again, my name is Gracia Ajeman, and I'm here with Dr. Kobe Mensah. My beautiful makeover was done by Domes Glow. You can contact her on 055-248-9442. 055-2489-442. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is the Dachi Kanya Video Podcast. Welcome back. As I said earlier, we are here today with Dr. Kobe Mensa. Okay, so Doc, let's continue from where we left off. What habits have you included in your daily routine as a leader? Wow, that's um, one of the profound questions. Uh, I think daily habits, um, one, I do not fail to read, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it almost sounds like a cliche. Uh, but of course, you know, as, you know, someone who is within the knowledge industry, mm -hmm. you don't fail to read. Yeah. And I do not read hard books as people would think. That. I, I read quite oh. very simple social media messages, <laughs> you know. And when I mean that, I mean script so sometimes you see institutions will post maybe one or two pages about some topic and i read that's how i learn okay. i don't learn through books <laughs> i learn through this small small script that's you know cool. but of course because of the foundation once you get to know certain theories you then you know, search in you know, a lot more and i will entreat people to take that habit because look these days we do not have time mm -hmm. and somebody will say time no day to, to actually read yourself entirely a, a, a huge book. But reading excerpts, you know, articles, few articles, will let you grasp and then search more, yeah. you know, about them. That's what I do. Okay, so what is your vision for Africa? Well, so uh, obviously, you know, for us who are not politicians, uh, we always wish that we could have a very united Africa. Those who are politicians, they may say that, but they don't mean that <laughs> because they, and as somebody would say, if you have that kind of, you know, Africa, what about who would lead us? And that kind of, you know, questions that people ask because people want control. Yeah. But for us, when I, and when I say I wish we can have a united Africa, I don't, I don't mean, you know, having a political system where people, but I wish that we could be much more integrated, mm -hmm. you know, that Ghanaians would understand and speak French, okay. they can easily go to Francophone Africa, come back and have, you know, okay. and not necessarily to stay there, but, you know, to mingle, for us to be able to move freely yeah. across the sub -region. That is my, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, view mm -hmm. or my vision of Africa. So whatever the politicians would do to actually facilitate that, they should do. I mean, within our own academic communities, we, we do that in terms of conferences, in terms of, you know. But when it comes to the political structure, then everything actually stops. All right. So I think that we must find a way of integrating further more into the African project, into the Pan-African project, as opposed to, you know, the kind of small, small places that we control and that we feel happy about. We have to be bold to take that initiative to make sure that we can be much more integrated. Okay. So... When you were speaking, you made mention of a united Africa. So we are going to make um, create a scenario right now. So we make the whole of Africa one country. 
and then we say we make you the president of Africa, yeah. the country Africa. Whoa, what's I'm going? <laughs> <laughs> what's going to be the first policy you would implement in your first year? Wow, tough question, but easy to answer. Remove the barriers. The immigration barriers must go. You know, first policy to implement. You're gonna have, you know, a, a universal passport for Africans to move wherever they want. They want. Ghanaians move to Cote d'Ivoire, move to Nigeria, Nigeria move to Ghana, move to Benin, move. To, that's the first policy. Okay. And then the other ones I can think about it later. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. So if yeah. you get the chance to travel to your younger self, yeah. what are going to be some of the things you would encourage? your younger self, to focus more on or to change? Well, uh, I wouldn't love to change much, but I would love to learn languages. Okay. You know, as I speak, and typical I can, mm -hmm. you know what it means. I can only speak, you know, Fanti okay. and Cree, okay. uh, sort of, you know. And, and then, of course, you know, English. I can't speak Ghana, I can't speak Ewe, Ewe can't I can't speak, speak Hausa. Which is sad. <laughs> I can't speak Hausa, I can't see. So I feel sad about it, mm -hmm. not to talk about it in French. You know. <laughs> so I think that for us to, we, we, we had systems that we could encourage. Mm -hmm. you know, the idea that the boarding systems and the school system, I think that we should have actually prevented people from choosing their language at school. So I shouldn't have done Fanti mm -hmm. in high school. I should have probably done Ga. Okay. At least that could have brought me a step closer. And then later on, I learned. So I, I feel that I could have been much more, you know, uh, versatile, especially when it comes to something that could actually link you more to the other people, mm -hmm. i.e. getting one or two languages to what I speak. Okay. That could have actually made it much more fulfilling. All right. So what advice would you give to the youth out there who are aspiring to become great leaders one day? Be bold, you know, and be committed to things. Um, I don't see the youth being, I could be wrong, but I don't see them being very committed uh, in doing stuff. I mean, you see snippets of stuff in there. But I remember that, you know, when we were growing up, we took up initiatives, voluntary initiatives, so young people has to, have to be committed to their own destiny, their own initiative, their own future, so that it makes it easier for elderly people to support you. Without that, nobody wants to waste their time on someone who is not serious. Okay. So the show has come to an end, but before we go, we would like you to share your favorite quote with us. Suffer to gain. Suffer to gain is actually a boat in my village near Takradi, <laughs> you know, and those days, you know, our, our place is fishing community. Mm -hmm. So we take inspiration from the names of the boats, okay. you know, and all the boats had their names. Some are 8-8, eight, eight, you know, some are suffered to gain, some are, you know, you know, you know, these kinds of names that we write on, Trotro and things. Yeah, the boats, you know, the fishing boats have their names as well. <laughs> and it's been with me for so long. In fact, I wrote an article Somewhere in 2004, and, yeah, 2005 or 4, mm -hmm. you know, in an American journal. And that was the title, Suffer to Gain. And so when you're, whenever you're taking steps, just don't think, oh, they say we should choose uh, this is long as a topic, then you choose anything and something. It has the potential to define your life. Okay. So have a thought about it. Speak to some elderly people about it and see how that can shape your future. All right. So thank you very much for being on the show with us today and so for your for time. I really learned a lot today. So I'm going to learn how to make people ride on me as I'm riding on someone. That's right. OK. So this is how we end today's episode of the Dacha Kanya Video Podcast. Once again, my name is Grace Ya Ajuman. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you same time. Thank you for watching today's episode of Dachikania. 
I hope you have been inspired. Please follow us on our various social media platforms and please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.